Well, good afternoon. If you'd like to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be reading there in just a moment as our brother did. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to express my appreciation to you, the congregation, to your elders for inviting me to be with you once again. Four years ago when you had me, uh, you took a blind chance. It was kind of a blind date. And you didn't know what you were expecting. But this week, if it doesn't go well, it's not on me. <laughs> you knew what you were expecting, what you got when you had me back. However, we'll try to make this do the best we can to glorify God. I appreciate Austin leading us in song so much, especially that last song. And it's good to see Ryan and Rebecca again. They came to you from the promised land, otherwise known as the great state of Texas. Uh, and I worked with them in a couple of gospel meetings in Abilene. They were close friends with my daughter and son-in-law and their family that lived there that worshiped with Ryan and Rebecca there in the southern part of Abilene. It's good to be with them again. I admire Ryan's talent a great deal. I really enjoyed his class and the things that he had to say there. And it's good to see them and, and to see the third one. She, she wasn't born in the promised land, but we'll, we'll pray for her anyway. <laughs> and uh, good to know Al and his work with you as well. Last time when I was here, he wasn't engaged in that, but now it's nice to know that he is. Good to be with you. When you hear the statement, it's the crux of the matter or the crucial point. What we're talking about is that something that is central, the central point, the, the, the point of the matter. When we talk about the crux of the matter, the word cross is where we get that expression, the crux of the matter, or this is the central point. Because the cross is the crux of the matter. It is the central point of the Bible story. Everything that precedes it points to the cross. Everything that succeeds it points back to the cross. That's why you'll have the statement that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. For which I delivered first of all to you that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. In chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Paul will say it this way. For the message of the cross, the central part of the message, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. And in chapter 2, in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The central point that I determined to only know was the cross. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul will talk about our boast is only in the cross. Our boast is only in the cross. The cross then is put for that which it accomplished and for the event of the crucifixion. We sing a song about the old rugged cross. That song's not about that wooden feature that extended from the earth. That song's about that gospel story that we call the wonderful story of love. It's about the central point. It's about the crux of the matter. It's about the message of the gospel. The cross of Christ. It is the anchor. It is the anchor point. It is the central point of our faith. It is the central point that makes us who we are. And without the cross, as Paul will say, we are nothing. So I want us to think for just a few moments this morning about the cross and what the cross says to us and why we need that cross. The first thing I'd like to suggest to you when we talk about the cross 
It addresses the desperate need that man has. Man has found himself in desperate need because man by his own doing, not by the prodding of God, not because man was programmed this way, man has chosen to set himself at odds with God. The cross is our fault. The cross is our flaw. And sin is a lifestyle that grows out of the kind of sin that we have committed. But sin is not in and of itself a flaw. It's a choice. Sin demonstrates a flaw. And sin produces a lifestyle. But sin is our choice. Sin is our dilemma. Sin is our problem. The cross was by the determinate counsel of God. Paul will preach, Peter will preach in Acts chapter 2 on that great Pentecost sermon. He said, you have by wicked hands crucified the Son of God, but it was by the determined counsel of God that you did so. God set forth a way for man. But man said, I'm going to do it my way. Man choosing then to set himself at odds with the way of God produced a flaw that he could not remedy. Produced a behavioral lifestyle he could not overcome. But it was his choice it was man's fault. It is man who chose to set himself against God. That therefore put man in desperate need. Man incurred a penalty that he could not pay. Man put himself in a position with God that he could not remedy. I wonder if we have become so comfortable with sin, that we fail to recognize that when we sin, we have set ourselves at odds against the Almighty Creator Himself, against Almighty God, and as a result of that, have incurred His wrath. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul will say, the wrath of God hath been revealed against all unrighteousness, wickedness, and ungodliness. The wrath of God has what? Been revealed. The wrath of God has been manifested. We don't have to guess about that. We know the wrath of God has been revealed. So man, by his own choosing, has set himself as an enemy of God has incurred a wrath that he cannot satisfy and has incurred a penalty he cannot pay. Man finds himself in a deep, desperate need. The cross addresses that deep, desperate need of man. The cross answers the plaintive cry O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body that is destined for death? The cross, the cross is the answer for man's desperate need. I want you to see, however, secondly, the graciousness of God in the cross. Yes, the cross shouts loudly. I have the answer. I can satisfy your deep need. But the cross speaks of the graciousness of God. As we said in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul said, I will only boast in the cross of Christ to which I am crucified and to which the world is death to me. The cross, that central message the central message of Jesus that he gave his life for man speaks of the graciousness of God. It says, number one, Jesus died for us. Here is the great shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. 
In Ezekiel chapter 34, you have quite a different picture that is painted of the shepherds of Israel. The shepherds of Israel who should have been giving their life for Israel now began to devour the sheep and began to take advantage of them and began to use them for their own personal gain. They weren't doing that for the sheep. They were doing that for themselves. Jesus died not to take advantage of us. He died for us. It might not be that He died for Himself. He died for us. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 2, just a moment. Hebrews chapter 2, I think, speaks pivotally about what we're trying to emphasize here with regard to the death of Christ. Notice in Hebrews chapter 2, what he will say in verse 14. Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus died for us to release to enable us to be freed from that bondage in which we were captive. Look in Hebrews chapter 2 again and verse 9. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that He by the grace of God might taste death for us. Jesus died for us. But Jesus also in His gracious provision died for our sins. In John chapter 10, in John chapter 10, you have in verse 17 where Jesus will say, I lay down my life, and if I lay down my life, I have power to take it again. But in John chapter 10, in verse 18, listen again, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to let down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from the Father. No man takes it from me. I lay down my life, and I lay down my life as a sacrifice for your sins. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You see this explicitly stated in verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 21. Listen to what he says here. For he made him who knew no sin. To be sin and supply their sacrifice. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin. Sacrifice for us. That why? we might become the righteousness of God. Another way to say that is so that we might be forgiven. Paul will say further in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God to salvation. And what does it say? For therein is the righteousness of God from faith to faith, from shore to shore, from beginning to end is what he says. Therein is what? The provision for man to be forgiven of his sins. Not only did Jesus die for us, not only did Jesus die for our sins, but he died to bring us to God. Look in Romans chapter 3. Look in Romans chapter 3. You're familiar, I'm sure, with verse 23. When he said, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But now then, look at verse 24 and going forward. Being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Now when it talks about God passing over our sins, He's not saying He gave a wink and a nod to that. What He's saying is, in this is the provision for God to what? To bring man to Christ. But there's a dilemma there. How can God be both just and the justifier of man to bring him to God at the same time. You can take one side 
of that equation real easily. You can say, well, God can be just. And that simply means this. If you sin, you die. That's just. But that doesn't enable man to have access to God. All that says is, you sin, you die. On the other side, you can deal with the second part of that equation by itself. He can be the justifier of those who believe. If you simply look at the justifier without looking at the just side, what God can then say is simply this. I know you didn't mean to do that. Just don't let it happen again. Now, He isn't just in doing that. He's given a wink and a nod and a, a quick slap of the wrist and you go on your way. But He's not just. But he's got to be able to be just at the same time allowing man by faith to have access to him. What's the answer? Christ. When by faith man allows Christ to begin to rule and work in his heart and by faith is brought to God through Christ's blood to have forgiveness of sins, God can then say, I can be just toward those who have refused Him, and I can justify those who have accepted Him. Now when it came to the cross, those who perpetrated that heinous crime thought that what they had done once and for all is rid themselves of this man, as Cephas said, that was going to bring down all the vengeance of Rome upon them. Here is this man that is a thorn in the side of the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They all that last week come trying to test him. But they all fail. But what happened with Jesus was not in their control. What happened with Jesus was by the determined counsel of God. And in that determined counsel of God, man's desperate need finds, finds his answer. And here is the gracious provision. In Romans chapter 3, you find three words that address man's dilemma. You'll find this word, being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Man needed redemption. There was a ransom price that was paid to redeem man. Here man has enslaved himself in bondage to sin. And man is impotent to break the bonds of sin. He by choice enslaved himself. That is his fault and it has become his flaw. And it has become his lifestyle. And man found himself in desperate need in prison. Sold out to sin. Paul will say in Romans chapter 7 and verses 13 and following. I am sold to sin. Man sold himself to sin. How then can man be redeemed? Redemption is a slave term. It's not a term that speaks of, of great friendliness. It's a slave term. And man had enslaved himself by his own choice. In Bible times, man could be enslaved as an indentured servant. Maybe he was impoverished and he would sell his land to someone that could buy the land and would enslave himself and his family. If a conqueror came and conquered the land, the conqueror would take back the best of the land and the people and leave those who were considered refuse behind. If those who were refuse that were left behind could then scrape together enough to go and buy back those who had been enslaved, they could be redeemed. Here man needs redemption. Man placed himself in a position against God to be enslaved. And it says we can be redeemed. Be redeemed by the blood of Christ. There's a second word there in that very same passage. Being freely justified. 
Man is guilty. Man has incurred a guilt that he cannot satisfy. That guilt shouts loud against him. But God can't just simply say, when you're guilty, you're just. Because that would violate what just means. But he says, I will therefore pronounce you justified. I will allow the price of your redemption, the blood of Christ, also to treat you then when you are forgiven as though you were innocent. It doesn't mean you were innocent. It simply means that when He looks at us based on the blood of Christ, our desperate need of guilt can be answered. Our conscience that pricks us can be quieted. In 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, You have a guilty conscience. Baptism is the answer. And the reason baptism is the answer is not because there's magic in the water or magic in the skill of immersion, but because baptism is the means by which God said, I will therefore cleanse you by the blood of Christ and I will stamp you justified. There's another problem with man. There's something else that grew out of this desperate need that man placed himself. There is a wrath that must be satisfied. There's a price that must be paid for that. He said, he is the propitiation. In 1 John chapter 2, he is the propitiation for all who believe and for all the world. Now I realize that that term, propitiation, is not a term that we use when we're sitting at Starbucks drinking our fancy latte. And it's probably not a term you use around work cohorts either. But it's a very important term. With those who worship idols, they would go in to sacrifice the idol and they would pour out an offering at the seat of the idol and in pouring that offering out, it would then be seen to appease the wrath of the idol. Paul took that term as it was used there to say, here there has been the pouring out of the blood of Christ and he is now the pouring out to therefore satisfy the wrath of God. The wrath of God has been revealed. That wrath must be appeased. And Jesus is that appeasement for the wrath of God. Now there's one other term that must be considered. When we talk about the gracious need, but it's not found in Romans chapter 3. You find this term in Ephesians chapter 2 which you see that we are reconciled to Christ. Both Jew and Gentile have been reconciled. Reconciled is a family term. You have redemption is a slave term. You have justified is a courtroom term. You have propitiation is a term to appease wrath. But now then there is an estrangement in the family. And he said, Jesus Christ is the means by which we can then therefore, what? Be made one in family with God again. You see, here's the gracious provision. He died for us. He died for our sins. And he died to bring us to God. And in doing that, he paid the ransom price for our redemption. In doing that, He enabled us to be justified. And in doing that, the wrath of God has been pleased. And in doing that, we have been reconciled again to God in one family. You see, man's desperate need was he had separated himself from God. Man's desperate need was he had incurred the wrath of God. And man's desperate need was he had found himself facing only justice. And man's desperate need was he is now enslaved. 
But the gracious provisions of the cross enable man to be redeemed. Enable man to be justified. Enable man to have the wrath of God answered. And enable man to be reconciled to the family of God. You see, when we say, I boast only in the cross, or we speak of the cross of Christ that men consider foolishness, but herein is the wisdom of God that is seen. But that brings us to a third consideration. We've seen man's desperate need. We've seen the gracious provisions. But now we must see the awesome results. Now we must see the awesome results. We see that beginning in 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you have this beautiful language that Peter will offer to us about what Christ did for us in His body. Begin with me in verse 21. For to this you were called. Christ suffered for us. Leaving us an example that you should follow His steps who committed no sin nor was deceit found in His mouth. Christ didn't die for Himself. Christ had not sinned. Who when He was reviled did not revile in return. But when He suffered did not threaten but committed Himself to Him who judges righteously. Now listen. Who Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. That we having died to sins might live for righteousness. By whose stripes we are healed. Directly out of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. The awesome result is Christ bore our sins in His own body. When we partake of the memorial feast as we did just a few moments ago, we have two separate elements. We have two separate memorials we call under one umbrella the Lord's Supper. The first is a memorial. is a memorial for what Christ has done in His body. And He in His body bore our sins. The memorial is that Christ bore our sins in His body. And as Isaiah will say, the chastisement that was ours was placed upon Him. He bore in His body our iniquities. He in His body carried that load. We have Christ who is the one who bore our sins. We don't bear those sins. He bore those sins. See if I can illustrate this. have to be careful with the dating here because it makes all the sense in the world if I miss it. If I say 1947, what I'm going to say is not going to make sense because it was 1847. October 5th, 1847. Abraham Lincoln. Now you know why 1947 doesn't fit. Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd and their children were going back to Lexington, Kentucky to visit some of, her, some of her family. But Lincoln had heard that there was going to be an auction that day. And he stopped to witness the auction. The auction was of a young girl by the name of Eliza. She was 164th African American but still considered Caucasian or white. She had olive colored skin, dark lustrous eyes, and dark straight hair. That day there was a man that was a Methodist minister by the name of Calvin Fairbanks present at the auction and also a thick necked Frenchman from New Orleans. The auctioneer began the bid. The thick-necked Frenchman bid $1,200. Calvin Fairbanks said $1,400. The Frenchman said $1,480. Fairbanks said $1,485. And the thick-necked Frenchman looked at him and said, How high will you go? How high will you go? He said, one dollar higher than you. And the bid stalled. The auctioneer uncovered her. And once again, the bid began, one thousand five hundred and eighty dollars. 
the thick-necked Frenchman said, and Fairbanks said, $1,585. The thick necked Frenchman stayed quiet. The auctioneer said, going once, going twice, going three times, sold. What will you do with her, sir? What will you do with her? Fairbanks said, free her. Free her. Christ bore our sins. The auctioneer was crying forth, what price are you willing to pay? He said, I'll pay the price of my body and I'll give my blood so that why? So that I can what? So that I can set you free. Go free. Go free. Go free. In that cross, Christ bore our sins. That's the awesome result. But in that you see something about the character of God. You see, number one, the immeasurable love of God. You see the almighty power of God. And you see the omniscient wisdom of God. And you see how God in His grace can justify the man that is guilty. For God so loved the world, you see His love. You see his wisdom because man looked at that cross and said, this is foolish, and show us a sign. They said, the sign was before them. And in that you see how God reached down to man to pull him to himself. The awesome result of that is you see it, you know. When you see the cross and you hear the message of the cross, you know God loved us. We know, we see God's wisdom when we hear that message and when we see that cross. But thirdly, you see in that the awesome victory that God gave man. In Hebrews chapter 2, we read in verses 14 through 15, He tasted death. Why? that those who were subject to fear and the bondage of death might be delivered. Death held sway over man. Death held sway over man because the grave held him in, in capture. Death held sway over man because his guilt could not be satisfied. But Christ enabled man to overcome both the guilt, the behavior of sin, and the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Our victory is in Christ Jesus. And as Paul will say further in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if he arose, he is the first fruits, and we too shall rise by his resurrection. And by His ascension, sitting at the right hand of the Father, He is now both Lord and Christ. And being both Lord and Christ, that grave has been opened. And man, man is now free. Free Him. Free Him. Man doesn't simply learn to cope with sin. Man in Christ is enabled to conquer sin and be victorious. And so we see victory in Jesus. That's the cross of Christ. There was a fellow by the name of Dr. Robert G. Lee who had taken a tour of Israel and this particular tour had taken taken him to Golgotha's point and that knoll he knew the story of and he raced ahead of all the others when finally the tour guide reached Dr. Lee Dr. Lee was stooped down on that naughty knoll called Golgotha after catching his breath 
the tour guide said, Sir, you seem like you've been here before. Dr. Lee, with tears streaming down his face, said, Yes, yes, I have. 2,000 years ago, I was here. And so were you. It was a man. It was just him and his only son. They were art collectors. And they'd gone around the world collecting various kinds and pieces of art. Expensive art. They'd amassed quite a collection of art. But the war broke out and the son decided it was his duty to go fight in the war. In fighting the war, one of his comrades was wounded. And he raced out on the battlefield to try to save his comrade. In the process of that, he was mortally wounded and he died. However, the man he went to save lived. That man that was, that was saved as a result of that son giving his life painted a portrait of the sun. It was not a masterpiece. And it was a faint resemblance of the sun. The surviving man found the son's father who was just completely crestfallen, completely shattered by the death of his son. And brought the painting and gave it to his son and said, I want to show you what I painted of your son. He saved my life. As time went on, the art collector died. All art collectors gathered because they wanted to bid for his art collection. But as the collection began to be bid, the stipulations of the sale were first read. The first piece to be sold was the portrait of the sun. You can imagine the rumble that began to murmur around the crowd that came to purchase these precious pieces of art from all over the world. Get on with it, get on with it. And the man said, he left, he left the stipulation, the picture of the sun must be sold first. Finally, one of the neighbors of the man that had died said, Ten dollars. Ten dollars. There were no other bids. At the end of going once, going twice, going three times, the auctioneer slapped his gavel and said, The sale is closed. The sale can't be closed. They all shouted. And the auctioneer said, but there was one more stipulation. The one who bought the picture of the sun gets the whole collection. And folks, don't you see that what Jesus did for us in that cross enables us to have all of the blessings that God wanted to pour forth for man when he put him in that pristine garden and said, with the exception of this tree and the fruit thereof, you shall eat everything. But the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And man ate and he died and he separated himself from God and could not find his way back. He incurred a wrath he could not satisfy. There was a penalty he could not pay. But Christ came, and He's the Son who gave it all. And giving it all reverted back to God's original design to say, I can have it all again. Because when you receive the Son, 
you receive it all. You see, that's what makes it important when we say, except you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. That's what makes it important when we say, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. That's why it makes it important when we say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Those aren't just accommodative terms to tell folks it's time to get out the song book. Those are words from God who says, If you want the Son, you can have it all, and I've made the provision for you to have Him. And it is due to my grace and my love for you. Are you estranged? Do you need to be reconciled? Are you enslaved? Do you need to be redeemed? Is there a wrath you cannot satisfy? Jesus can. He paid it all. If you need Him, come while we stand and while we sing.